Hi, my name is Lisa Fernandez. I'm the Associate Director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Welcome. This talk is sponsored by the Yale Center for Environmental Communication. And right off the bat, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from land originally of the Quinnipiac Nation and stewarded by them for many, many generations. Based at the Yale University School of the Environment, the Center for Environmental Communication focuses on four areas. First, we conduct research on the psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence environmental attitudes and behavior. Second, we teach students and train working professionals. Third, we convene a global network of climate communication scholars and practitioners. And finally, we inform and engage the public through environmental journalism, including Yale Climate Connections, which is hosting this talk today, a climate-focused news service that engages many thousands of people every day and includes a short daily radio story that airs on more than 680 stations nationwide. Just some logistics to start. The chat is closed. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and be aware that you only see the question you yourself asked. We have folks on our end monitoring the questions. So be assured that your question will be seen. So with that, let me turn it over to Bud Ward, the editor of Yale Climate Connections and co-founder of the Society of Environmental Journalists. He'll introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna make my introduction of Dr. Jeff Masters very, very short, but I wanna save as much time for the information packed uh, material that he's going to present to you all. I am going to say what many of you know, and that is that Jeff is a co-founder of Weather Underground. Uh, he's also the uh, meteorologist for Yale Climate Connections. Um, I'm not gonna mention much about hunting Hugo because I know he will, but I want you to take that part of, the, uh, of his message to heart, including the link to it. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit of story about Jeff. In 2005, he was advised by another co-founder of Weather Underground while they sat in Ann Arbor that Jeff should start a blog. And Jeff said, what's a blog? And um, Jeff's next, next comment, this is a quote, was, sounds like a waste of time. What am I supposed to write about? After a little bit more general persuasion, Jeff responded, okay, but I doubt I want to do this thing for very long. Well, those of you, like so many who have followed Jeff's blogging, uh, know that that didn't work out as planned. His uh, initial responses did okay, 10, 11, 12 uh, commenters and so forth. But a little bit hobbled by his second post because he had an, uh, a uh, typo, uh, as is not uncommon in, in blog world. But uh, he wanted to say celebration of Earth Day as a title of it. Instead he, instead, he used two T's. So I guess that would make a celebration of Earth Day. Despite that misspelling, uh, Jeff went on to blog. In uh, August of 2005, a momentous month in uh, climate history, uh, hurricane history, Jeff was in New York meeting with Associated Press. They were expressing an interest in sharing Weather Underground, his site, with its 5,000 newspaper members. Then along came Katrina. Jeff, shortly after that, uh, realized that his comments were getting 1,000 comments a day in the first 24 hours or so. That made him, quote, again, a quote, a true convert on the value of blogs little idea that it was destined to become the focus of my professional life. Well, Jeff has indeed, with the help of Bob Henson, another meteorologist, uh, journalist, also a regular contributor to Yale Climate Connections, uh, they created an amazing community of weather enthusiasts. Um, over roughly 3,000, I'm sure that number is a little bit dated now, but 3,000 or so blog comments in the first 14 and a half years and hundreds of thousands, I think we could probably make that millions of comments over that period of time. Uh, Jeff became recognized as uh, one of the foremost commentators and certainly bloggers on climate and um, extreme weather issues. He's been writing for uh, Yale Climate Connections for just about 15 months now. 
And that short team, 50 month, 15 months, started June 10th last year, 2020. Uh, he's bylined or co-bylined with Bob Henson more than 200 posts in just uh, 15 months. Now, I wanted to make two more comments, and this is to tell you what you don't know about Jeff Masters, or maybe what you don't know. I found it interesting when I learned that Jeff established a very generous Jeff Masters Student Support Fund at the University of Michigan's Climate and Space Science and Engineering Department. Uh, very generous indeed uh, on Jeff's part and the university's part. The other thing you may not know about Jeff that you can tuck away, uh, I don't think there'll be time for this today, but that is that he plays trombone. And with that, I wanna introduce uh, our guest speaker, uh, Jeff Masters, Dr. Jeff Masters. Jeff, take it away. Thanks a lot, bud. And I really appreciate that Yale Climate Connections gave Bob Henson and myself a home after IBM decided they didn't want us anymore. So uh, let's dive right in. We've got a lot to cover. This year has been a really insane weather year. And we're, we're going to get a, a stormy 40 minutes in here, but I, I promise there'll be a rainbow at the end. So my former job, as Bud alluded to, was a scientist with the NOAA Hurricane Hunters. I did that for five years. And during that time, I got to fly into two Category 5 hurricanes. Uh, the last one, almost permanently last one, was Hurricane Hugo. And you can read the story of that uh, at that link there. And actually, it's been made into a 45-minute TV show in the Smithsonian Channel series, uh, Air Disasters. You can see an actor playing me in the cockpit being shaken around. It's quite the story. So yes, I did found the Weather Underground way back in 1995 with, uh, there's my professor, Perry Sampson. And from that humble beginnings, yeah, it came along this, this whole crazy blogging thing that I've been doing since 2005. Okay, let's dive into 2021, a year of incredible extremes. I've been a meteorologist 40 years and some of the extremes I've seen this year, uh, boggled even me knowing that, you know, here we are with climate change, it, it intensifying extremes. I want you to look at this list and mainly focus on the top four items. We've had four, what I call mega disasters, that is disasters costing more than $20 billion. And if you look at the list of $30 billion disasters this year, those top four disasters account for over 70% of the costs of pretty much all of these weather disasters. Uh, that's uh, something we need to think about because mega disasters, those are the ones really driving the increase we're seeing in disaster losses in recent years. And I might add too that uh, from this list, you'll notice that 10 of the disasters, the billion dollar disasters were severe weather and uh, five each for uh, droughts, for winter weather disasters, tropical cyclones and flooding. So let's look at the curve here of billion dollar weather disasters. And we only have a partial tally for this year. We're up to 30 so far. Uh, it used to be that 30 would pretty much set a record, but no longer. There's really been a huge increase, well, not only in billion dollar disasters, but also in weather disasters in general. And okay, so part of that is due to the fact that we've got more people, we've got more people owning stuff, more people living in dangerous areas, so more losses due to extreme weather events just because there's more stuff in their way. But part of this increase is also due to climate change, I am convinced. The climate change has increased the frequency and intensity of several kinds of extreme weather disasters. Not all, but certainly we know that uh, heat waves are more intense from climate change. That's pretty much uh, rock solid science. Uh, wildfires we're pretty sure about too. And while tropical cyclones, now let me just say that a tropical cyclone includes hurricanes, which are in the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific, typhoons, which are the same thing, but in the Western Pacific, and uh, in, the tropi uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, they're just called tropical cyclones. It also includes tropical storms and tropical depressions. So in other words, uh, tropical cyclones, which are uh, getting more intense with uh, rising ocean temperatures, uh, we expect them to be causing some of this increase in disasters as well. 
I might also mention that there's some controversy about, okay, how much is climate change contributing to the observed increase in disaster losses due to weather disasters? Uh, you can factor in uh, gross domestic product and say that, hey, you know, compared to the increase in gross domestic product we're seeing, uh, the rise in severe weather disasters in recent years is no big deal because you know, they haven't really increased in relation to the increased wealth of the world. Well, there was a couple of problems with that. One is I'm not convinced that's really true because uh, when God created scientists, he created economists to make meteorologists look good. And uh, second of all, when you're talking about the increase in uh, total wealth in the world, that has come at the expense of the environment. We've charged up our credit card. We've dumped our waste products in the atmosphere. We've pumped away our groundwater. We've taken our soils and let our soils run off into the ocean, lost tremendous amounts of topsoil. So we're borrowing against the future right now. This increase in wealth we're seeing is illusionary. We've got to pay the bill and the bill is coming due now. So it's interesting when we're looking at mega disasters now, weather disasters costing more than 20 billion. And you look back starting in 1980, which is the first year I really have good stats. We had just a couple in the 1980s. Those were actually both droughts that hit the US. But in recent years, we've seen a concerning increase in these mega disasters, $20 billion plus disasters, the ones most likely to cause severe disruption, not only in the affected population, but globally potentially too, due to the increasingly interconnectedness of our society. So this past year, 2021, we're already up to four mega disasters costing over 20 billion. That's a new record. Two of those in the US, one in Europe, and one in Asia, China specifically. So this is a very concerning figure for me to see this rise in mega disasters and I don't think it's due just to increases in wealth and population living in harm's way. Climate change is part of this equation. And climate change is definitely causing more extreme events. And when those extreme events happen to happen where we've got a lot of infrastructure in the way, they are going to cause some of these mega disasters we're seeing. So let's go to Europe. Poor Europe. They had a $30 billion flood disaster this year that hit Germany and Belgium, killed over 240 people. And it was the most expensive weather disaster in Europe's history. Inconceivable has happened. Floods have inundated the Eiffel region. Help. We're drowning here. Can anyone hear us? So that was a brief clip of the impacts there in Europe. And you can see on a list of the top 10 most expensive weather disasters in European history, the flooding in Germany and Belgium this year stands head and shoulders above the rest. I might mention I'm getting these statistics from the International Disaster Database, which is called EMDAT. Uh, actually, I also like to use numbers from the insurance broker Aon, AON, who also does disaster estimates. Uh, their numbers are a little bit different than the, this list here. Uh, they've got a couple over $20 billion weather disasters here for Europe, but it gives you the general idea that uh, this year's disaster was just pretty much unprecedented in European history. Now let's think about China. In July of this year in China, the uh, mega city of Zhengzhou had a flood disaster that dumped 25 inches of rain in just 24 hours. That's pretty much their annual average. They get slightly less than that in a whole year. And as you can imagine, the resulting floods in this city of 10 million people were just inconceivable. This is the subway system. shopping mall. Now, if we look at the list of most expensive weather disasters in Asian history, this year's floods rank number three, $27 billion. 
And there've just been a couple other floods, one in China, one in Thailand that were more expensive than this year's flood disaster in China. There have been some studies done on flooding in China, uh, specifically linking increased flooding to climate change. We do expect that in the future, we're gonna see heavier monsoon rains in China as a result of warmer ocean temperatures off the coast, allowing more water vapor to evaporate and contribute to heavier rains. So I might also mention that uh, all of these numbers I'm throwing at you are inflation adjusted. We're talking 2021 $20, dollars for all of these, not in the dollars that they were originally uh, in, accrued in. So let's think about uh, one of the uh, two mega disasters we had in the US this year, Hurricane Ida, which made landfall in Louisiana as a category four storm with 150 mile an hour winds and did 27 to $40 billion in the landfall region near uh, Louisiana and then went up to the uh, Northeast US and caused an additional roughly $20 billion up there due to an extreme flood disaster. Uh, these numbers are preliminary. They're from the insurance company CoreLogic. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more to say about this disaster as far as damage estimates in the future. We don't really have a good handle on just how much this incredible disaster wrought. So here's a view from inside the uh, New York City subway system during the uh, heavy rains from Ida. Newark Airport. <laughs> and this was actually the uh, second hurricane this year to cause flooding in New York City subway system. Hurricane Henri, a category one storm early in the year, also caused flooding in one of the subway stations in New York City. From uh, this chart here, we see that Hurricane Ida is not only the fifth most expensive weather disaster in US history, it's also the fifth most expensive weather disaster in world history because uh, the US knows how to do mega disasters. The, the top, oh, eight or 10 weather disasters in world history for expense are also, you know, happen to be in the US. As you can see from this list, most of them are hurricanes. The top seven are hurricanes. But also you see in there three droughts and heat waves. Uh, they're also a significant concern for extreme weather events uh, going forward in uh, not only the US, but in the world. You see it in, down at number 18 there, that's the fourth weather mega disaster of the year. It also hit the US, a, a winter weather mega disaster costing 23 billion, uh, mostly affecting Texas. Now that's one that is controversial whether climate change might be playing a role. We expect in general, that winters are gonna grow warmer and extreme weather disasters due to winter weather are gonna decrease in a future warmer climate. Although there are some studies showing that if you do heat up the poles more than the equator, you might get crazy jet stream behavior that could impact this. But that's still an area of active research. We're really not sure going forward how much you can blame winter weather craziness on uh, climate change. So in these flooding disasters and rainfall disasters from tropical cyclones, they have a common theme, heavy rains, and we expect heavy rains to be on the increase in future years due to climate change. Here's a plot from the National Climate Assessment from the United States showing in the US the increase in very heavy precipitation. These are the top 1% sort of events that occur when it rains and how they've changed. And over the past 60 years or so, every region of the US has seen an increase in these heaviest precipitation events, the ones most likely to cause extreme floods. They're particularly bad in the Northeast US, the ones hit by Hurricane Ida this year. You can see a 71% increase in these extreme precipitation events. Now for the world at large, you're seeing a similar effect 
where extreme precipitation events are the ones that are increasing the most strongly in our warmer climate. And that's because as you heat up the oceans, they ev will evaporate more water vapor into the atmosphere. There's about a 7% increase in water vapor every degree centigrade that you warm things up. And that extra 7% of moisture may not seem like much, but think about that. Now you've got an extra slug of water vapor going into uh, storms and it invigorates those storms when that water vapor condenses and releases what we call the uh, latent heat, which is the extra heat required to get that water vapor produced in the first place. So when that heat is released, it invigorates the updrafts in the storms. Now they grow larger and longer lasting. They pull in even more water vapor and can get even more intense rainfall going. So that's the mechanism behind a lot of these extreme precipitation events we've been seeing in recent years. There was a study published just this week that uh, I'm still kind of puzzling over, which showed that over the past 20 years or so, tropical cyclones, which again includes both hurricanes and typhoons and tropical storms, we're seeing a 21% increase globally in the amount of rainfall they're dropping and that's just for a 0.2 degree centigrade increase in, in the temperatures in the, the region of these storms in those 20 years. Now, our computer models that we use for the climate were expecting even less than that increase, a 14% for a much greater global warming of two degrees centigrade. So uh, this is a very concerning result. I don't know what to make of it yet, but uh, there's some evidence that in some cases, this mere 7% increase in global water vapor we see with a hotter climate could translate to a, a crazy sort of increase in where we don't expect it in storm behavior where they can drop more precipitation. Well, it's time to change gears here. Let's, uh, let's leave the floods behind and let's talk about heat. This summer saw the most extreme heat wave in world history as far as the extremity of the records broken. This is the one occurring in late June that affected Western Canada and the Northwest US. It hit 121 degrees in Canada at the town of Leighton uh, one day before they burned down in a wildfire. If that's not uh, indicative of the situation we face now, I don't know what is. I mean, who would have thought 121 degrees, 49.6 Celsius in Canada of all places. And that same heat wave, Death Valley, California broke the all time world heat record for the second week or second year in a row, 130 degrees Fahrenheit or 54.4 Celsius. Also this summer, the summer of 2021 was the hottest summer in US history, tying with the Great Dust Bowl summer of 1936. And July of 2021 was Earth's hottest month in recorded history for the whole globe. Now, this is happening in a year when we're seeing it in the Pacific Ocean, uh, cooler temperatures than usual due to a La Nina event. And as a whole, for the entire year 2021, we're expecting it to be the sixth or seventh hottest year on record. So that's pretty extraordinary that with some lingering La Nina coolness, we experienced the hottest month in world history and the hottest summer in US history. That just goes to show you the amazing heating impact of putting all the greenhouse gases we've put up there into the atmosphere. With the heat, has come fires. California has been burning the last few years. This year, they had their largest single fire on record, the Dixie Fire, which is near 1 million acres now. And uh, just last year, the August Complex was their largest total fire on record. The Dixie Fire is destroying everything in its path in Northern California. The small community of Canyon Dam was swallowed by flames Thursday. Wind pushing the fire up dry timber as 5,000 firefighters try to control the blaze. I've been fighting fire for almost 25 years, and this is the most extreme fire behavior that I've ever been a part of. Dixie 
So the eight largest fires in California history have all come in the last five years. We've really changed the climate there. They're in a mega drought. And with that fire has come smoke, unfortunately. Uh, this graph here is showing a satellite estimated uh, measurement of the amount of smoke in the atmosphere. The satellite peers down and, and looks at what they call the aerosol optical depth, where aerosol refers to the small particles of smoke. And when averaged over the entire um, US and Canada, you can see July of 2021 here set a record for the most smoke ever detected by satellite. Now that has some uh, major repercussions for health because wildfire smoke is deadly. You can see uh, the quote there at the bottom, uh, it was estimated up until 2016, the yearly death toll due to wildfire smoke in the US was 3000. And that's just to short term exposure, less than two days. Uh, you can be sure that this year and uh, back in 2018, the death toll is much higher. So here's a bit of a complicated uh, concept here, which I'll spend a little time discussing. A large region reason for some of the extreme weather we've been seeing is due to the jet stream, which has gone misbehaving in recent decades. A wildly oscillating jet stream is responsible for a lot of these extremes we've seen. The plots here are showing the north-south winds in the upper atmosphere at the jet stream level this summer, actually in June, when we had our intense heat wave. That big red blob you see in the center there, that's centered over the western part of North America. That's where you're getting southerly moving air, a ridge of high pressure set, set up there, a record strength ridge that brought them their incredible heat wave of June. Uh, counterbalancing that over the eastern U.S., right in the center there, you see downward or, uh, north to south moving air, uh, bringing cooler air and wet conditions. So these sorts of wild jet stream swings are something that has increased in number since the 1990s, and it has been connected to climate change. In particular, the going theory is that uh, loss of Arctic sea ice and increased heating of the Arctic areas has been causing uh, a change in the temperature differential between the poles and the equator, causing the jet stream to start making these unusual loops and causing this extreme uh, weather and, and heat sort of behavior we've been seeing uh, in summers. And I might also mention that uh, that sort of extreme behavior of the jet stream is not really modeled in climate models. So that when we make estimates of what probability an extreme weather event has had, it doesn't take that into account. So we're almost certainly underestimating the influence of climate change on extreme weather events due to this jet stream effect. There was some good news this year in the climate world. The amount of melting of Arctic sea ice was uh, much lower than we've seen in recent years. Uh, it was uh, the least extreme since 2014 and the Northwest Passage did not open to ice-free shipping for the first time in a while. However, over in Greenland, they did have a lot of uh, ridging and the high pressure and sunshine. Uh, they had a big melt year. In fact, they observed the first rainfall ever seen at the summit at 10,000 feet. All right, let's talk about hurricanes. It's been crazy the last two years in the Atlantic. 50 named storms the last two years. Our average is 14 per year, so we'd expect 28. Now this year's not even done yet either. I think we're gonna still have uh, six more named storms, three hurricanes, and two of them being intense hurricanes here in 2021 due to uh, developing La Nina and warmer than average temperatures in the Caribbean. Uh, really unusual this last two years is 19 US landfalls by named storms. Uh, you're only expected to see three in a year yeah, and so 19 in two years, uh, that's really unbelievable. I never thought I'd see something like that in two years. So uh, the number of Atlantic named storms has been increasing. Uh, going back to 1968, when we first started naming subtropical storms, uh, you can see a steady increase. Uh, and I got 2021 in there, uh, uh, pre preliminarily, it's gonna go higher. Uh, but interestingly, the main contributor to this increase in the number of named storms in the Atlantic is very short storms lasting two days or less. In fact, this year, we've already set a record for the number of short-lived storms. There have been nine of them. 
So these short-lived storms are really not that big a concern for the amount of damage they cause. Uh, if you look at the uh, 50 or so billion dollar weather disasters due to hurricanes in the US, only two of them have happened from short-lived storms. So we're not too concerned about these short-lived storms. It's the longer-lived storms, the major hurricanes that we're most concerned about. Well, why have there been so many storms in the Atlantic? Increase in sea surface temperature is a good bet. You can see over the past century or so, you've had a couple degree Fahrenheit increase in the temperature of the ocean waters in the main development region for hurricanes. That's from the coast of Africa to the Caribbean. Well, you might think, okay, so the waters are warm, global warming, right? Well, it's more complicated than that. Because at the same time, a lot of the warming has been due to the fact that we're emitting less air pollution, thanks to clean air regulations in the major industrial areas. So over the North Atlantic, over the past 20, 30 years, the amount of uh, uh, sunlight obscuring pollution has gone down uh, 30, 50%, something like that. And that has allowed the waters to warm up. So a large re reason for the increase in Atlantic activity, both in, the, in fact in the number of named storms and in major hurricanes, we think is due to this less pollution in the atmosphere causing more sunlight to reach the ocean and heat it up. Uh, the other thing we think is causing a lot of these uh, short-lived storms is increases in our ability to detect them. We've got better satellites now, they're higher resolution, We've got better techniques that uh, forecasters have used to analyze hurricanes, and that's largely driving the increase in the number of named storms. It's not a real increase, it's spurious. Uh, I'm still thinking that maybe uh, the increase in sea surface temperature due to global warming could be involved, but uh, that's less certain at this point. We'll have to see going forward how that shakes out. Interestingly, uh, this is a plot of the number of major hurricanes that have hit the U.S. since 1953. Uh, here I'm using central pressure to delineate major hurricanes. Uh, you could use wind speed as well from uh, 115 mile an hour winds and higher. Uh, if you do that, you lose that hurricane in 2008 and that one in 2012. Uh, there was a huge gap there where we didn't have a major hurricane as rated by the Sasser Simpson scale. Uh, but we've been making up for that in the last five years. You can see there have been uh, eight major hurricanes making landfall in the U.S. So this plot does give you, uh, gives me a little uh, hope that, hey, you know, uh, this is cool that uh, no increase in major hurricanes hitting the U.S. due to climate change, apparently. Uh, but even if that's true, when a major hurricane does hit now, it's gonna do more damage because sea level is higher. There have been three studies looking at the damage from Hurricane Sandy in New York City in 2012. And the estimate is, is that sea level rise in the past century has caused an extra two to $8 billion in storm surge losses due to Sandy's storm surge that would not have happened if sea level had stayed constant. So when a storm hits now, it's riding, the storm surge is riding up on higher sea levels, and that's going to increase in the future as sea level rise accelerates. That's right, sea level rise is accelerating. It's not increasing linearly. It's a quadratic curve that fits the data now, and it's going to grow several feet higher in the next, uh, you know, 50 plus years. Also, when hurricanes make landfall, they are moving slower, we've discovered. We don't understand why but a slower moving storm will jump more rain and give you a storm surge longer, increasing the damage. Also, there's some evidence that tracks might be shifting on hurricanes. They might be going more to the east, which would affect the population centers of the east coast more, causing more damage. So even if we're maintaining our um, level of hurricanes hitting the US at a constant level, they're gonna be doing more damage when they hit just due to these climatic factors. Uh, they're also going to be dumping more rain because the oceans are warmer, evaporating more water into the air, creating heavy precipitation. Uh, here's a shot of Hurricane Irma back in 2017 affecting the Virgin Islands. Interestingly, even though the level of major hurricanes hitting the U.S. has remained constant since the 50s, the number of major hurricanes hitting non-U.S. has increased, uh, as shown by this plot. 
Uh, certainly, uh, the Lesser Antilles have been, been uh, badly affected in recent years by major hurricanes. Uh, 2017 was a particularly bad year with uh, Irma and Maria. Another concern about hurricanes is they're intensifying more rapidly. Again, that's a, a effect that we expect to see due to warmer oceans. And we are indeed seeing more rapid intensifiers, uh, not only uh, in the Atlantic, but uh, globally as well, although we're most confident in the Atlantic numbers. I might add here that all of our ability to understand what's going on with hurricanes and tropical cyclones in general globally is hampered by our database. It's in very poor shape. Uh, it's in decent shape in the Atlantic comparatively because we've got the hurricane hunters there. But uh, globally, we only got global coverage of satellites in 1998 when the Indian Ocean suddenly came on board. So we don't have a very long data set to study tropical cyclones. And our techniques for doing this are not uniform. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how, how hurricanes are changing and in the current climate because we have such a poor database. So a lot of this is very frustrating to me. I mean, I'm showing you a lot of results here, but the uncertainty is very high. And I have to admit that uh, I don't really understand fully the implications of what climate change has done now to damages due to Atlantic hurricanes and how much of it is due to a changing climate and how much of it is just due to economic reasons because we've got more people in harm's way due to increased vulnerability. If you look at a, a global method of assigning intensity, uh, we had a number five most intense storm on record, Sergei, in the uh, uh, Northwest Pacific this year, which was incredibly in April. But uh, this list here shows that uh, four of the top 14 most intense cyclones by this method were um, in the last 10 years, which is about what you'd expect from chance, not uh, in indicating a global warming problem. And indeed, if you look at a uh, number of category five hurricanes globally, uh, they haven't really shown a trend. They've been pretty flat since 1990. So uh, that's an encouraging uh, statistic there. But again, our database isn't that very good for detecting these sorts of changes. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, interesting exercise would be to extend the Saffir Simpson scale, scale to include a category six and seven. Uh, if you do that, category six would fall somewhere around 180 miles per hour, category seven, maybe 215. And if you try and plot up, you know, a category six timeline, this is what it would look like. These are storms with 180 mile per hour winds or greater. It does seem to show an increase in uh, recent decades um, over the, the globe. Uh, I might mention 1997 has got that big spike because we had a record strength El Nino that year and the Pacific Ocean got very hot and we had a, a ton of category five storms that year. If you look at each ocean basin, when their strongest cyclone on record was, seven out of eight of these basins set a record for their most intense tropical cyclone in the past uh, eight years. Uh, the only exception to that is uh, in, over in the Atlantic, uh, we, I separated it into two regions, the Caribbean slash Gulf and then the open Atlantic. Gilbert of 88 is the only one that we haven't beaten yet. And uh, I have to brag that I, I was actually in Hurricane Gilbert when it was the most intense Atlantic storm on record with a uh, 185 mile an hour winds and 888 millibar pressure. Uh, now, now I might mention the, these records are by this satellite estimation the actual uh, official record for the strongest hurricane is Hurricane Allen, 190 mile per hour winds, 1980. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over that one and go to drought. Uh, drought in recent years has been increasing in the amount of damages it's been causing, and that's not a surprise. If you've got a hotter climate, you're going to cause a greater impact on drought because plants are gonna suffer more and uh, you're gonna spend more energy uh, uh, heat heating the ground rather than evaporating water to uh, get the same temperature. So hotter world, more drought, a big concern in the US. This is the latest drought monitor from uh, yesterday. We've got a uh, very intense drought going on over the Western US. And this has been uh, the same picture for a lot of years in a row for California. 
Now, to what extent this drought is contributing to global food, food prices is a big concern. My number one concern for climate change is an increase in drought due to hotter temperatures. And if we look at food prices this year, they're the highest they've ever been globally since the mid 1970s, higher even than they were in 2011 when the Russian drought caused uh, food riots in the Arab world. So uh, here's a shot of the food riots. We had uh, the, go the governments of Libya and Egypt both fell due to the high price of wheat. And that was due to the Russian drought of that year. And they, they cut off exports and it caused food prices to spike. So my greatest fear from climate change is due to food prices causing uh, war potentially, uh, instability certainly, and there was a food system shock report that Lloyd's did back in 2005 talking about, you know, what could happen if you had multiple uh, bread baskets who grow grain with droughts all seeing failures at the same time. They gave an 18% chance in 40 years of an, a shock like that causing rioting, terrorist attacks, civil war, mass starvations, and severe losses to the global economy. So let's look at the future forecast for drought. If this forecast is true, we're in deep trouble. This is for 70 years from now. It's from a, a bunch of models, 14 different models used to generate the IPCC report. And it's showing pink. That's the extreme level of drought. Now, this is an average condition. This is not an extreme year. This is the average sort of drought levels expected 70 years from now under a moderate global warming scenario, not even an extreme one. This is a scenario that would we, we would have to work very hard to achieve. And you're basically seeing the end of the Amazon, you're seeing uh, the Mediterranean region uninhabitable almost, at least to, to grow crops, and also severe impacts in Africa, China, and North America. Uh, like I said, if, we're, if this forecast is right, we're in trouble. Uh, also, something to be concerned about with uh, food supplies is choke points. There are all these choke points where global tra trade passes through, and they're all vulnerable to climate change. Uh, we saw one uh, this year, Suez Canal got blocked. Uh, there's some possibility that climate change could contribute to that because the, the ever given, the ship that uh, blocked it, uh, lost its way in a sandstorm. And that sandstorm happened right at the end of a near record March heat wave that dried out the soil and potentially contributed to that sandstorm. Also, we gotta be concerned about not just drought, we gotta be concerned about storms affecting our food supply. Here you see Hurricane Ida this year, its eye wall moved directly over the port of South Louisiana, which handles 60% of all US grain exports. For almost a month now, our grain exports to the world have been severely reduced. They're about 50% of average right now. They were 100% down for a couple of weeks. And it's a really good thing that Ida did not hit during October during the peak of the grain export season or global food prices would have seen a huge spike. Uh, just briefly, I'm going to go over uh, the most concerning research result this year, which found that the global current system called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, a mouthful, AMOC, this includes the Gulf Stream, which transports warm ocean water from the uh, equator to the poles. Uh, that is in danger of collapsing, potentially, something climate models couldn't have thought didn't think could happen for another at least 50 years. Uh, all signs are that this current system is in danger. <clears throat> if that happens, it could have severe impacts on global climate. Uh, temperatures would plunge over the European region and parts of North America up to uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit colder. And uh, the biggest concern to me would be drought. Here you're seeing extreme drought conditions affecting uh, India, parts of Africa, and uh, Central America as well. So uh, that's something to, to be watchful of. If the AMOC collapses, we're, we're in uh, a bit of trouble, a lot of trouble. So <laughs> here's a, a research paper published way back in 2004 that was very prescient, I thought. We are already observing signs of instability within the climate system. There is no assurance that the rate of greenhouse gas buildup will not force the system to oscillate erratically and yield significant and punishing surprises. Sound familiar? If it seems like we're headed towards a cliff at high speed, uh, I've given you the right impression. 
And in this situation, it's good to think about having a parachute. And uh, here, here's what my family did. We decided to invest in property in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which should be a relatively safe climate change retreat. And uh, ironically enough, the place we bought property is on a river called the Hurricane River. And there you see my sign there in front of the river. And uh, also, uh, they're not immune to climate change either. You see that bridge in the water there, that was our bridge over. It got washed out by the uh, wettest year in history we had last year. So we had to uh, build a zip line to go over the river. So let's go to solutions. I'm not all problems, I'm, I'm into solutions too. We got to do two things. We got to stop emitting greenhouse gases. That's called mitigation. And we have to adapt. Here's an example of an adaptation, uh, protecting a wooden sign against a fire in Sequoia National Park this year. Uh, there was some good adaptation news this year, or I'm sorry, today, the uh, National Flood Insurance Program it, uh, went into some reforms that uh, should help price the cost of flood insurance more appropriately. We've been subsidizing building in high risk areas and we need to stop doing that. This is uh, Grand Isle, Louisiana after Hurricane Ida, certainly a high risk flood area. We should not be subsidizing building there. Well, you say this is all gonna cost a lot. How can we do it? Well, when you think about cost, think of how much air pollution costs. It costs over a half a trillion per year in the US alone due to the amount of deaths that we see in this country. Globally, we're estimating somewhere around 9 million deaths a year due to air pollution. And this is a very heartening slide that uh, I'm seeing. The cost of wind and solar is now less than the cost of pretty much all fossil fuels. The economists got it wrong. They didn't think we could possibly see costs fall this far, this rapidly, and indeed they have. So that gives me a lot of hope for the future. So uh, here's the uh, real solution to the climate crisis. We need to get hurricanes spinning in opposite directions to cancel each other out. I think the onion had it right here. Uh, so how are we gonna geoengineer that to happen? I don't know, but we'll think of it. And uh, speaking of geoengineering, uh, that's the intentional altering of the climate, uh, presumably by putting uh, dust in the stratosphere to block out the sunlight. There's gonna be a lot of push for that in, recent, in uh, coming years and we need to resist that that's going to be pushed by the fossil fuel companies so that they can keep on emitting the greenhouse gases that we've been doing. It's not a cure-all. There's a lot of problems. We're apt to cause more problems than we'll solve by doing a geoengineering effort. Uh, and I promised you a rainbow at the end. And uh, here's my rainbow. I, I came up with a, a few uh, items of good news that uh, happened in the climate this year. And uh, I, I laid them out there. You, you can read them if you want. Uh, and I'm reminded uh, kind of our situation is kind of like uh, what John Wesley Powell must have felt as he, when he was uh, floating down the Grand Canyon for the first time as we uh, brave the unknown rapids of climate change. Here are his words. We are now ready to start our way down into the great unknown. We have an unknown distance yet to run, an unknown river to explore. What falls there are, we know not. What rocks beset the channel we know not. What walls rise over the river we know not. So uh, Powell's expedition made it through the canyon, but the brave explorers endured great hardship and only five of them finished the voyage out of eight. Uh, I'm optimistic that we will successfully ride the rapids of climate change, but not without great suffering and destruction of much that is precious. By late this century, I think we will successfully switch to a non-polluting source of energy and reach new areas of stable climate. But there are, are too many talented and dedicated people to understand the problem that are working too hard for us to fail. With that, I'm going to give you my final slide and thank you for listening. And I'll turn it over to the moderators for questions. Jeff, the first question that came in, um, how do you see extreme weather affecting a pr property and casualty insurance and reinsurance pricing? And uh, maybe I can extend that just a little bit. Not only how is it affecting now, but how do you, what's your crystal ball for that? Uh, what do you see in the coming years in that respect? That's a difficult business to be in and I would not want to be in your business. I mean, we saw one of the earlier graphs I showed you that we had a 11 year gap in major hurricanes hitting the US. And uh, over the last uh, five years, we've had eight of them hitting. So. 
hurricanes are your biggest drivers of extreme weather disaster costs. And they're so variable just naturally that it, it's tough to smooth out those variations and figure out what's gonna happen. So uh, the, the risk is high. We're gonna get a Hurricane Ida hitting a even worse area to be at than we did. I mean, we got lucky because uh, New Orleans uh, was suffered a direct hit. The levees held, thank goodness. But if uh, Ida had tracked just 20 miles further to the east, you would have seen the levees of New Orleans get overwhelmed and we're not sure they can handle that even with their upgrades. Likewise, we've got extreme situations in Houston, Miami, Tampa Bay. If any of those get one of these climate change souped up mega storms we've been seeing globally, these category six storms, uh, that's gonna be a, a real eye opener. Jeff, another question. Uh, the questioner wants to know if there's any prospect that we will uh, witness again the kind of multi-decadal multi uh, period of reduced hurricane activity as we saw from the 60s to the 80s. Uh, can we count on that uh, coming again soon or ever? I don't think so. I think that lack of activity was due to the fact that we had put so much air pollution in the air, it was shading the ocean and keeping temperatures cool. That's not gonna happen anymore. In fact, we're gonna be reducing air pollution, at least I hope we do, because we've got millions of deaths it's causing. So that points out to me that there is no such thing as the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. That was just an artifact of the fact that we were putting a lot of pollution in the air. And climate change is gonna keep heating up the oceans and we're gonna get more extreme hurricanes in the future. Jeff, here's a third question. There's a lot of talk in political and policy circles about going to zero emissions or significantly reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 or 2035 or 2050. Can we anticipate that, that those reductions will lead to fewer storms, floods, and heat waves? Will there be much of a lag time? And if so, give us the exact number of years that lag time. Yeah, I mean, everything we do to reduce emissions is gonna help reduce extreme weather. Uh, and there is some research that's been done showing that if we can keep the global warming under two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial, this wild jet stream behavior we've been seeing is not gonna get a whole lot worse than it is. But if we blow past that limit and go to say 2.9 degrees centigrade of global warming, that's the course we're currently on, then you will see a sharp increase in extreme jet stream behavior. So we got to try really hard to, to hit that two degree centigrade target. Uh, I don't think we're going to make 1.5 degrees centigrade, that's for sure. And as far as a lag time goes, yes, there is a lag time. Uh, it's a number of years. Uh, you can think of it as uh, roughly five years, I want to say. Uh, and unfortunately, also, as we emit less pollution, that means we cut down the amount of air pollution in the air, which allows more sunlight in. And you will see a, it's kind of a, a half a degree centigrade or so of global warming baked into the system already that we haven't realized yet because we're masking it. Jeff, a questioner from Zambia in Africa asks, how can we help the African continent with the kind of knowledge and information that you've imparted here today? What can be done to help them better understand the situation they might face? Yeah. Um... You know, it's good to be educated. The more you know, the more you have power. So spreading the information you have to decision makers is certainly critical. Uh, I actually talked to my congressperson this week and gave them a lowdown of, of what I know. And I, the key to solving the climate crisis is leadership. We have to elect leaders that understand the issue and will take action. Uh, individual action is helpful, of course, but it's gotta be solved collectively on a global level and it has to be a political solution that we all come together on. Jeff, another question. Uh, the questioner asks, uh, where would be the best place to move to in the next 50 years or so to be more protected from climate change? I gave you my vote in you know, Michigan's Upper Peninsula, but uh, <laughs> that's got a problem. Uh, they get so much snow there, lake effect off snow, Lake Superior. I can't even get into my property for four months of the year. Uh, certainly north is better if you're in the Northern hemisphere. 
closer you know, uh, to where there'll be an equitable climate, uh, islands, you, you uh, run the risk of drought. Certainly in the Caribbean, we're worried about drought in the future. Uh, Hawaii maybe is gonna be decent. Uh, you don't wanna be near the coast, obviously, because rising sea levels are gonna be a problem. So I would go where there's a lot of water. Uh, certainly uh, northern tier of states in the US are looking good or southern Canada are looking good. Uh, and in Europe, uh, the farther you go away from the Mediterranean, the better, because uh, they're already getting drought induced conditions in the Mediterranean region of Europe, and that's only going to intensify. Jeff, a questioner wants to know uh, if you envision the extreme weather being an effective motivational tool to encourage uh, policymakers to further reduce emissions. You would think, <laughs> you know, uh, back in the 1980s, we had the ozone hole open up and uh, the world's leaders collectively said, OMG, you know, this is a serious threat to civilization. What are we going to do about it? And the nations of the world got together and established the Montreal Protocol and saved us from a catastrophe. Uh, there have already been a lot of ozone hole moments already, and that has not happened with climate change yet. And the reason is because the political and financial power of the fossil fuel industry is unparalleled. They're the richest industry in world history, and they're going to lose profits if they lose their main product. And they've been pushing hard against having any meaningful uh, reaction done to limiting emissions. So uh, it's, it's got to happen, though. I mean, uh, there have been some encouraging signs this year that their power is waning. Uh, for instance, Harvard and the University of Michigan divested from fossil fuels. And there's an increasing push within the boardrooms of these companies themselves to do something about, hey, we've got this climate crisis. Uh, this is a planetary emergency and we've got to stop burning fossil fuels immediately. Jeff, a couple more questions in the few minutes we have left. Uh, what do you think of the notion that wildfire smoke is helping deflect some of the sun's heat and therefore having a cooling effect? Uh, not that that necessarily is an argument for wildfire smoke. Yeah, uh, some of the record highs we would have set this past year and last year too did not happen because wildfire smoke was obscuring the skies. Uh, for instance, in Death Valley, I think uh, we would have gotten a hotter than 130 uh, this year if there hadn't been a little bit of wildfire smoke in the air too. So yeah, uh, that is a, a feedback which is slightly helpful. You do reduce the intensity of your heat wave when you start burning your forest and obscuring the ground with smoke. I might also mention though that smoke travels a long ways, lands on the Greenland ice sheet, makes it darker, and that helps the ice sheet absorb more solar energy, helps drive more melting of the ice sheet, raise sea levels, and contributes, contributes to uh, climate change. A question would like you to elaborate on uh, fossil fuel industry's uh, strategy, if that's what we call it, to add particles to the uh, atmosphere, that is to support geoengineering. Yeah, it's not just the fossil fuel industry pushing it. I mean, there, there's a lot of people who want to do geoengineering and it would be relatively cheap. It would cost just a few billion a year. It would emulate what volcanoes do already. Volcanoes put a lot of small particles of sulfur in the, in the stratosphere, which stay up there for a few years and they block sunlight. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, you cause drought as well and you probably cause jet stream behavior we don't understand. So it, it's a huge risk. Uh, we should probably continue doing research on it in case we've got to do a Hail Mary, but uh, boy, I sure don't want to go there. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you, you, you think everything's cool, uh, we can handle this, but uh, <laughs> humans uh, don't understand the system very well. And if we're going to muck around putting extra pollution in the atmosphere, uh, that's a sorrowful thing. We shouldn't be doing that. Let's see if we can squeeze in two more questions, Jeff. A questioner says, we've had three years of La Nina resulting in severe California drought. What has caused this anomaly? And what caused an El Nino with result, and what, and what would cause an El Nino with resulting more in more California rainfall? This fall is a, yeah, the second straight year we've had La Nina going on. Uh, that's pretty common, actually. About 50% of all La Nina events have a, a second year develop uh, in the following winter, northern hemisphere winter. 
So yeah, that's the natural cycle. Every two to seven years, you get a La Nina, and then it cycles to El Nino. So I don't see that the cycle is out of whack right now. We're going to get an El Nino maybe next year or the year after, it balance the cycle. Uh, when we do, it, it's going to be uh, a record hot year probably. And finally, Jeff, can you point to what you might consider some of the most important, most urgent research questions, research needs to help address some of the uh, remaining un great unknowns in climate and, uh, and, and uh, extreme weather? What's going on with the jet stream? We know it's gone berserk in recent years. We don't quite understand why. We really need to pour a lot of talent and effort into understanding what's going on with the jet stream. That's, that is happening already. But uh, that's kind of the key because our current generation of climate models is really not doing the job there. It can't really simulate what's we, what we've been observing. So our cloudy ball, our, our crystal ball is, is a cloudy ball. We're, we don't know what the future holds. And so far, our experience is uncertainty is not our friend. The climate models get uh, criticized for being uncertain. They are. But time and time again, we're seeing that unexpected, intense weather events are happening that the climate models did not anticipate. And we've got to make a better generation of models that uh, can give us better forewarning of where we're headed. Last question, Jeff. How confident are you that Antarctica and the Greenland ice fields are sufficiently stable that they won't slide into the seas? Well, it's a matter of what time scale you're talking. Uh, slide into the seas. They're not going to slide into the seas in a period of a few years. It's going to take decades or centuries or even millennia. We've already passed the critical point where Greenland is not going to be able to recover. And over periods of thousands of years, it's going to go away. Uh, same for the West Antarctic ice sheet, it's thought. Uh, maybe we'll figure something out around that. But uh, it seems unlikely at this point. Uh, I think it's going to be. Uh, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet is a, the greatest danger of what you can uh, call, quote, sliding into the sea, but that's going to take decades to happen. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm going to pass it back to my colleagues in New Haven to wrap up the session. I can say to the audience that uh, we will have Jeff's presentation available, uh, the PowerPoint, or I guess it's a keynote presentation, but we will be making that available. We'll also be making the video from this presentation available. So stay tuned for those. And back to New Haven. Thanks so much, Bud. I just, first of all, like to say thank you to everyone who is in attendance today. Um, I'd like to give a very nice round of applause to Jeff. Sadly, the worst thing about Zoom is that you can't hear how many people are clapping right now, but I can assure you it was a wonderful presentation and I'd like to thank you very much for it. Bud, thank you for moderating. And yeah, as, as Bud had mentioned, we will be having a video online of this event. If anyone knows someone who wasn't able to make it, it should be on our YouTube uh, page fairly soon, as well as the slides from today's events. Um, in addition to that, I'm gonna drop right now in the chat, just the YCC link so that if anyone's interested in looking at some of the stories, they can go check out that website um, and look at them. And yes, I again, one final round of applause. And I'd like to also advertise that in about two weeks, we will be having another event in this series that we run here at the YCEC about climate communications, where we talk with faith communities and how religion and ecology connects. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks.